Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Lahari Desaid and the topic for today's discussion is Principles of Radiographic Interpretation and Radiographic Features of Diseases Manifesting in the Jaws. Now this will be dealt with as a three-part series uh, lecture and this is just part one of the lecture series. The learning outcomes would be to analyze the five principles of radiographic interpretation, identify dental anomalies, inflammatory lesions, traumatic conditions, cysts and tumors of the jaws on dental radiographs, and explain their clinical and radiographic correlations. Identify and describe the radiographic characteristics of malignancies, systemic diseases, and bone diseases affecting the jaws. Summarize the radiographic features of TMJ, salivary gland disorders, craniofacial anomalies, and panar nasal sinus anomalies. So it's pretty much uh, uh, sums up most of the radiographic um, manifestations of the jaws and sums up pretty much half of the radiology um, uh, interpretation of the textbook content. When we're talking about prescribing dental imaging, uh, there are certain important points that need to be kept in mind. Number one is the need for imaging. Do we really need to take an x-ray for this particular case? And if yes, which is the kind of radiograph that would be useful? For example, if when the abnormality that cannot be assessed fully clinically during clinical examination alone, or when the disease is not clinically evident, it's important that imaging comes into play in um, aid to diagnostics and uh, x-rays are uh, then of help. Uh, also, it's important to check any previous radiographs or previous imaging done. So that's always useful to understand that how the disease was probably a month ago or two months ago and how is it at the moment. Administrative radiographs, um, for example, taken for insurance claims, are some things which I personally do not recommend or, uh, or, or shouldn't be done too often unless they are absolutely mandatory. And of course, radiographs taken for special considerations, with special considerations like during pregnancy or radiotherapy patients, it's important to keep in mind that less is more. So I always abide to the principle of ALARA. Now, these are examples of cases and the type of imaging that would be the best for that particular case. For example, a 10-year-old child coming with mixed dentition and a stainless steel crown and deciduous molar done four years back with tight contacts and you want to assess the area. So, a bite wing would be the ideal type of radiograph which could help you assess the case. A 26-year-old with a fractured incisor restored six months ago who's currently asymptomatic and the vitality tested normal, you ideally don't need imaging for this kind of a case. A 65-year-old, multiple carious teeth with 7mm pockets and most of the teeth, then a full mouth series examination of IOPARs or dental radiographs would be the ideal um, imaging of choice because you want to look at the uh, depth of caries in detail as well as you want to assess the bone loss in detail. So um, a, a full mouth examination would be a lot more um, convenient in giving you more details than a panoramic radiograph. An 18 year old with impacted third molar in third, three quadrants and probably symptomatic only on one side. Even then a panoramic radiograph would be one of the best choice of imaging in this case. 45 year old was indicated for a single tooth implant. First, the radiograph to be taken would be a periapical, simple uh, single periapical of that area, followed by a panoramic to visualize the uh, scout, like a scout image or a screening image to see if there are any other abnormalities. Then a small folk, uh, uh, field of view CBCT would be the ideal choice. Uh, lastly, a five year old, first dental visit, no evidence or no clinical evidence of caries you do not require imaging at all. So like I said in the previous slide, administrative imaging for just getting the case done or just to keep a record or just to make your patient happy is not recommended because any amount of radiation, especially in case of children, is um, to be avoided. Let's come to the principles of radiographic interpretation. First of all, acquiring the appropriate diagnostic image is the uh, key 
So to identify the best image possible for your case, it's important to keep in mind that what is adequate to see the area or to be imaged. If it's a single tooth or a couple of teeth, it's important that probably an IOPAR would be more than enough. But if you're looking at more detailed area, like you want to place an implant, then you probably require um, a CBCT. So um, the hierarchy of imaging should be kept in mind. Also, are sing single images enough for the case or do you require multiple images? When you're doing plain radiograph, let's say you want to see one area um, and you're not satisfied with the way the appearance of the tooth is, let's say it's a root canal treated tooth and you're trying to assess if the root canaling has been done well. So you might want to take another image with the shift technique to assess all the canals, whether they've been filled or no. And when do you apply advanced imaging? Other than acquiring the appropriate diagnostic imaging, the next point is to have um, ideal viewing conditions. Also, systematic image analysis needs to be done. So especially for the novice dental uh, practitioner or dental students who are understanding or trying to assess images um, for the first time or who have less experience, it's important to follow the radiographic interpretation format. The simple format in, uh, of dental uh, radiographic interpretation, for example, following the crown root, starting with normal landmarks, following the crown root, um, periapical, lamina dura, PDL space, um, and then coming on to the apical region bone would be a best method to analyze the uh, image without missing any points. Um, lastly, application of diagnostic reasoning in dental radiology is something which is acquired and can be, the skill can be acquired by viewing more and more radiographs and correlating it to the clinical findings and um, looking through the images again and again to understand what is normal versus what is abnormal. What happens is we tend to form a mental 3D image of the lesion in, in our mind and this con complex uh, perceptual image identification is what gets retained in the brain and each time you look at it the eyes uh, send the signals to the brain and you identify it as normal versus abnormal. So what are we going to look at? Uh, we will be looking at dental caries, periodontal disease, inflammatory lesions of the jaws, cysts, benign tumors, malignant tumors, diseases of bones, systemic diseases, paranasal diseases, uh, dental anomalies, developmental disturbances of face and jaws, as well as trauma. To analyze intraosseous lesions, there are certain steps that have been laid down. Step one is to localize the abnormality. Step two, to assess the periphery and shape. Step three, to analyze the internal structures. Step four, analyze the effects of the lesion on the surrounding structures. And step five, finally, to formulate a radiograph diagnosis. So following this five-step method would be easy to go about any radiographic interpretation of a lesion that you're looking at on a larger radiograph or a smaller radiograph. So step one is to localize the abnormality. When we're talking about localizing, it's important to assess where the location of the lesion is. What is the anatomic position? Where is the epicenter? Where is it originating? Is this lesion localized or generalized? Are you looking at only one area in the entire jaw having this particular either radiolucency or radiopacity or are there multiple such areas? Is it unilateral or bilateral? Is it single or multifocal? So these are some things which you need to keep in mind as a step one of the process of interpreting a radiograph. Step two would be to assess the periphery and the shape of the lesion. When we're talking about the periphery, we're talking about either it being well-defined, punched out, corticated, sclerotic, or having a soft tissue capsule. So these are the common terminology used in radiology to describe the periphery of a lesion. Following this, you could also talk about ill-defined um, areas which could be blending or invasive. When we're talking about shape of the uh, lesion, we use, usually use the terms like circular, scalloped, or irregular when you can't define the shape properly. Now, this is examples of well-defined corticated borders. Uh, here you can see in the examples listed here that the lesion seems to be pretty rounded, circular, and having a nice sclerotic margin. Um, in the first case, this is an example of an impacted tooth with a well-defined radiolucency around the crown. 
And the second case is that of a central and the lateral with the well-defined radiolucency arising from the apex of a tooth, as well as a third case, which is showing you a root stump with a well-defined uh, cystic radiolucency. So this is what we call as a well-defined corticated border. On the other hand is a blending radiolucency where uh, you see that you know the margins are not very well defined and then the margins of um, they blend into the adjacent normal looking bone so this is called as a blending uh, margin or and, and in this radiograph you're seeing that there's a radio opacity where the margins are actually blending again into the normal bone and you cannot really define the um, edge of the uh, lesion. This is an example of multiple punched out radiolucencies. Um, this is a, a true skull view and uh, this sort of appearance generally is seen in multiple myeloma. And this is a very old radiograph. We generally don't do skull imaging of this sort very often these days. And it's mostly um, either a CBCT or a CT scan. But this kind of appearance or can be seen in all kind of radio, radiographic imaging uh, and is called as punched out radiolucency. The radiolucency appears as though you've used a punch and uh, made multiple holes. Step three would be to analyze the internal structure of the lesion. Is it totally radiolucent? Is it totally radiopaque or is it mixed? When it is mixed, it's important to describe the pattern that is visible in the radiolucency or, or in the uh, lesion itself. For example, in the first radiograph here, you see a completely radiopaque lesion surrounded by a radiolucent rim. Whereas in the second radiograph, you see a, a ground glass like appearance, which is very typical of um, fibrous dysplasia and the description of the pattern that is ground glass or orange peel are commonly used in radiographic terminology to describe the trabecular pattern um, which is not normal. Step four of the analysis would be to analyze the effects of the lesion on the surrounding structures. Uh, the surrounding structures we mean would be the teeth, lamina dura or pedial space. What has happened to the inferior alveolar canal or the mental foramen? Uh, has the lesion invaded the maxillary sinus? How is the surrounding bone density and trabecular pattern? And is the outer cortical bone intact? And is there a periosteal reaction? An example for this that you've seen here in the pictures would be the effect of the lesion on the mandibular canal here. In both these lesions, you see that the mandibular canal has been involved. The lesion has managed to push the mandibular canal or involve the mandibular canal. Coming to step five of the uh, analysis or radiographic interpretation is formulation of a diagnosis. So this is the final step. So when you are formulating a radiographic diagnosis, it's important to uh, keep the image analysis algorithm in mind. Um, <clears throat> firstly, to analyze whether the lesion that you're looking at is normal or abnormal. If abnormal, then is it a developmental disorder or is it acquired? If it is acquired, then it would fall under the category of either a cyst, inflammatory lesion, malignant neoplasm, benign neoplasm, bone dysplasia, vascular lesion, metabolic lesion, or lesion due to trauma. While writing a diagnostic imaging report, these are the following important points that need to be present essentially in the report. First of all, the patient uh, and the general information about the patient. Uh, what imaging procedure was done? What is the clinical information that is important to correlate with the radiograph? Uh, the findings that were uh, seen, the observations from the diagnostic image. Interpretation of the image, uh, which includes what your thoughts are on the radiographic differential diagnosis. And lastly, the name and signature of the clinician. Now, with all of this having said, what, what is important to remember is that proficiency comes only with practice. And, and it's very true for radiographic interpretation. The more radiographs you see, the more likely you are uh, to be able to interpret them with confidence. So let us look at some normal anatomy that could mimic uh, radiographic appearances that we were talking about. 
and just to keep in mind the how the uh, maxillary region looks like the mandibular uh, anterior region looks like or the mandibular posterior region looks like so the arrows here are pointing towards the cej and the uh, lamina dura and in this radiograph up here you see the uh, lingual foramen and so anatomy is something which needs to be kept in mind before you are analyzing any area to understand which region you're looking at and what could be the normal anatomy that could um, superimpose over the region and uh, aid you in diagnosis. So if you were to look at dental caries, the arrow pointing out here, this is the bite wing radiograph and you can see on the pro proximal surface, uh, distal surface, this is probably uh, the <clears throat> left premolar um, or molar bite wing. You can see that there's a radiolucency and it's involving the enamel and dentine and it looks very much like a dental caries. When we're talking about deep caries involving pulp, um, <clears throat> it involves the enamel considerable amount of dentine and very close to the pulp horn. So that is how you analyze whether there is, uh, you know, how deep the caries is based on the perception of depth of the uh, caries as well as the proximity to the pulp. In case of periodontal diseases, there are certain limitations of radiographs. We must understand that radiographs, uh, plain radiography especially, is a two-dimensional image. So there are a lot of overlapped bony defects which could give you an appearance that the radiograph is actually showing less severe bone destruction. So clinical correlation is very important. So <clears throat> another important thing you need to keep in mind is that pockets cannot be seen. Pockets are soft tissue structures and you can't really assess them on radiographs. So what you can really assess is how much amount of bone destruction has happened because of the pocket in that area. For example, you can easily analyze what is vertical bone loss and what is horizontal bone loss, um, which is leading to periodontal disease. <clears throat> Let's look at some inflammatory diseases of the jaws. First of all, chronic apical periodontitis. It appears like widening of the periodontal ligament space. Uh, generally seen in a tooth which is having pulp involvement, either because of caries, fracture, or um, trauma from occlusion, um, are a few of the factors where you can see that there is widening of the pedial space, generally the apical area, and thickening of the lamina dura around the apical region of the tooth. Next, let's look at periapical granuloma. Uh, Periapical granuloma and cyst are sometimes difficult to differentiate on a radiograph. Uh, nevertheless, they both appear as well-defined radiolucencies at the apex of the tooth, which is having pulp involvement. The <clears throat> lamina dura is actually continuous with the lesion and appears as though there is widening of the PDL space and a well-defined radiolucency at the apex of the tooth. This is what you can see in the lateral incisor here as well as the palatal root of the molar in this uh, radiograph. A periapical cyst, on the other hand, is uh, a larger well-defined radiolucency, generally lesser than 1 cm um, would be suspected of a granuloma, where anything larger than 1 cm has to be a periapical cyst. So uh, again, there is loss of lamina dura, the PDL space uh, cannot be differentiated, and there is a large radiolucency which is arising from the apex of the tooth, generally involving uh, pulpinely involved tooth. You can see a similar uh, radiolucency with very defined sclerotic margins with this root stump here. Now that, that's again another reason why I keep insisting and telling the students that even radiographs of root stumps are important because you never know what lesion is lying underneath. So kindly do not uh, extract root stumps without radiographs. A periapical abscess on a radiograph is generally defined by ill-defined radiolucency. The borders blending into the normal bow and uh, <clears throat> generally not having a very defined uh, sclerotic margin like a cyst or, or, or even a granuloma. So generally, if you're able to make out radiolucency due to pulpal involvement in the periapex of a tooth, it's already a chronic abscess. This is similar to seen in the um, anterior region here. This arrow mark is pointing out towards the radiolucency, but it's important to keep in mind this is the premolar region and this could be the mental foramen 
um, which is a normal landmark not to be confused as a peripical relief sensory. Rarifying ostitis and uh, uh, sclerosing or condensing ostitis are again very purely radiology terms. Rarifying ostitis is the term used when you're seeing um, an abscess-like appearance, but inflammatory disorder due to a cavitated or a fractured tooth which pul with pulp involvement. And there is radiolucency which is merging or blending into the normal bone. So on the other hand, condensing ostitis would be the term given to excessive bone formation. Uh, again, due to an inflammatory process. So this is an image of how condensing ostitis would look like. And the one on top is what radiolucency, more radiolucent appearance is called as rarefying ostitis. The more radio opaque appearance is called as condensing ostitis. So based on our sequelae from pulpitis, it is important to remember that bone reacts by both bone formation or by bone resorption. So there is, if there is more bone resorption, then the lesion that would uh, appear as a result of inflammatory process is a rarefying ostitis. But if there is more bone formation due to osteoblastic activity, then the lesion that would appear as a result of inflammatory process is a condensing ostitis. Moving on to endoperio lesions. So this is an example of a case which I have picked up <clears throat> which shows you a hemisectioning of the tooth um, after root canal treatment. So what we see here is that there is good amount of um, angular bone loss um, about you know around 7 to 8 mm below the CEJ as well as a radiolucency involving the tooth and a broken instrument in one of the canal. Because of a carious tooth, there is a radiolucency as well. So this is definitely an endodontically involved as well as a periodontally involved tooth. So this lesion has got endodontic involvement as well as periodontal involvement and the abscess that has resulted as a reason of this is called as an endoperio lesion. On the other hand, a perioendo lesion would be one where periodontally involved primarily leads to retrograde infection and the tooth becomes non-vital. So that would be a perioendo lesion. Periapical scar is a term used to denote the radiolucency that is retained in the bone after a surgical procedures, which is done for generally an endodontically treated tooth. And the apical scar is the area where um, properly surgical removal of the cystic lesion or a periapical lesion is done. So the, the bone pattern is changes retained for a very long time and that appearance is called as a periapical scar. Periostitis is the appearance uh, again, inflammatory disorder due to an um, <clears throat> infected tooth where the periosteum of the maxillary sinus, the layers of the bone appear to widen and raise up. And this appearance is very typically seen in the maxillary sinus because it's very thin bone, especially in the premolar or the molar region where the roots of the premolars are very close to the floor of the maxillary sinus. And the appearance is called as periostitis. Proliferative periostitis, also uh, older terminology, Gary's osteomyelitis, gives the appearance of the outer layers of the bone raising out due to, again, inflammatory reaction, especially seen in children. And this appearance of layered appearance of bone uh, separating out or the periosteal part of the bone separating out from the body of the bone of the mandible especially is called as onion skin appearance and referred to as proliferative periostitis. Osteomyelitis, on the other hand, can have various manifestations in the bone. It is a disorder, uh, it is an inflammatory reaction or inflammatory uh, condition of the bone and the bone marrow. Again, uh, caused because of uh, either uh, trauma or decayed tooth or fracture. And this appearance of uh, new bone as well as old bone mixed together is called as a moth-eaten appearance. The arrow mark is pointing out towards the involucrum. You can also see sequestrum and uh, that is what gives the appearance of a moth-eaten uh, appearance which is has patchy radiolucencies and radio-opaque appearance. 
Osteoradio necrosis, even though the etiology could be because of radiation involvement of the bone and infection of the bone, the appearance is very similar to that of osteomyelitis. Essentially, it is a type of osteomyelitis where the bone loses its radiolucency, uh, its density, and is it's infected, the bone and the bone marrow, and it appears like, again, a moth-eaten appearance. Similarly, medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaws also appears similar. It could be due to bisphosphonates or other medicines which can are known to cause uh, um, necrosis of the jaw and can appear like a moth-eaten appearance in the mandibular bone. Now that we've looked at the inflammatory lesions, I've just added some additional notes on how radiolucent and radioopaque lesions or mixed lesions of the jaws can be differentiated. So what I've listed out is a differential diagnosis. Uh, more of this can be referred to, to <clears throat> as you go through these uh, examples. So radio, lo, radio, let's look at some radiolucencies of the jaws. This is from a textbook called Wood and Goes. It's a very old textbook uh, and does not have any newer additions to it, but it definitely gives you um, a good differential diagnosis to start your work with. So if you were to classify radiolucent lesions of the jaws, then uh, the most important types would be anatomical, uh, radiolucencies, periapical or pericoronal, interradicular, solitary cyst-like radiolucencies, uh, multilocular radiolucencies, solitary radiolucencies which are ragged and poorly defined borders, multiple separate well-defined radiolucencies or generalized rarefactions of the bone. Anat anatomic radiolucencies can be seen in the maxilla or the mandible and shouldn't be confused for uh, pathology. For example, an incisive foramen in the maxilla or the nasolacrimal duct and lingual foramen in the mandible shouldn't be confused for pathology. <clears throat> the best example was that of a mental foramen superimposing over uh, the apex of the premolar, mandibular premolars, being confused for a periapical um, radiolucency due to a decayed tooth. So uh, these are examples of periapical radiolucencies, pericoronal radiolucencies, and interradicular radiolucencies. The periapical ones would be generally due to pulpoperiapical radiolucencies uh, like the granuloma, radicular cyst, etc. The ones which we've just gone through or, or it, you could rarely have some cystic lesions which are superimposing over the periapex. On the other hand, pericoronal radiolucencies are generally the follicular space or the dentigerous cyst arising from around the crown of a tooth. They can also be ameloblastoma or COT or AOT. The interradicular radiolucencies generally arising in between the roots are due to a periodontal pocket or focation involvement or sometimes a periodontal cyst or even incisive canal cyst in the maxillary anterior region. Solitary cyst-like radiolucencies not necessarily contacting teeth uh, could be due to post-extraction socket, a residual cyst, a traumatic bone cyst or OKC which could be examples of cyst-like and then uh, appearing in the um, <clears throat> mandible or the maxilla. Multilocular radiolucencies are the ones which have multiple locules. Common examples would be ameloblastoma, the OKC, central giant cell granuloma, uh, myxoma, aneurysmal bone cyst, etc. Solitary radiolucencies with ragged borders or poorly defined borders. Common examples are osteomyelitis, fibrous dysplasia, metastatic tumors, definitely, or simply chronic ostitis, which is shown in the pictures over here. Multiple separate radiolucencies with well-defined uh, borders could be anatomical variations like marrow spaces or multiple myeloma, like showing the punched out radiolucencies in the picture here. Generalized rarefactions in the jaw bones could be because of uh, bone disorders like hyperparathyroidism leading to bones or called as bones tumor, osteoporosis, or other uh, malignancies like leukemia, Langerhans cell disease, etc. When it comes to radio opacities of the jaws, radio opaque lesions of the jaws could be again anatomical, periapical, solitary radio opacities which are not contacting teeth necessarily or periapical separate radio opacities, multiple separate radio opacities or generalized radio opacities. 
So if you were to look at anatomic radiopacities, they could be common to both the jaws. Um, in the maxilla, you could simply have the zygomatic bone or the nasal spine, which is, looks like a radioopacity. And in the mandible, it could be the mental ridge or the mylohyoid ridge. True periapical radioopacities are like condensing or sclerosing mastitis, cemental dysplasia, cement, hypersementosis. Whereas false ones are anatomical structures or supernumerities which are superimposing over the existing periapical region. True intrabony radioopacities are like tori exostosis or idiopathic osteosclerosis, for example, in this case, which is not necessarily contacting the tooth and is slightly separated from the apex and it appears in the periapical region though, and that is a, a idiopathic osteosclerosis. Projected radioopacities could be foreign bodies or soft tissue masses which are superimposed over the jaws and multiple separate radioopacities could be there which are like multiple retained roots or impact teeth, calculi and generalized radioopacities like florid cementosis, dysplasia, pedges disease or osteopetrosis. Mixed ones, there's a wide variety of mixed radiolucent radioopaque lesions. Um, <clears throat> they could be associated with the teeth and not necessarily contacting the teeth. The ones which are associated with the teeth could be the periapical or pericoronal, um, close to the pericoronal area. The periapical ones could be calcifying crown of a developing tooth or simply rarifying and condensing osteitis, pictures of which we've just seen. Pericoronal lesions, which could be uh, adenomatoid odontogenic tumors or COC, amyloblastic fiber odontoma, all of which appear mixed in origin. Mixed lesions, which are not necessarily contacting teeth and are separated from the teeth, could be like chronic osteomyelitis, osteoradial necrosis, fibrous dysplasia, or even um, chondromas and chondrosarcomas. So that brings me to the end of this chapter. I've given you a uh, a broad view of how to diagnose or basics of principles of radiographic interpretation. Uh, you can build up more on this by referring to the textbook. And it's really important that you go through more and more radiographic pictures or in the textbook to give you an idea how variations of the lesions that we've described look like. Thank you.